Welcome back to Investigator Insights, looking at the CMET receptor, targeting this receptor as a therapeutic strategy for cancer. In the first session, we talked about some of the science of uh, the hepatocyte growth factor, ligand, and the CMET uh, receptor, tyrosine kinase. And so now we're gonna look at some of the early clinical data, the phase one and phase two trials, and identify some of the novel agents that are emerging as potential clinical agents uh, in the future. So, David, let me uh, let me go back to you first. Oh, I forgot. David Spiegel, Johanna Bendel, both from the Sarah Cannon Research Institute. So, um, what about um, the the mechanisms for targeting CMET and and its receptor? We talked a little bit about uh, tavantinib as as a tyrosine kinase uh, inhibitor. Uh, what type of, of targeting mechanisms are being looked at uh, coming out of pharmaceutical companies and research labs? I think so far the uh, development plan has uh, paralleled what's happened in other receptor tyrosine kinase pathways. So you can target the ligand, in this case HGF or scatter factor, you could target the receptor itself on the external domain, the extracellular, or, the extracellular domain, or you can target uh, the intracellular domain with small molecule inhibitors. And that's, that's where we're at right now. So several um, monoclonal antibodies have been developed that do just that, that serve as, um, as, as drugs that focus on the ligand. Uh, and, and of course, uh, more recently, some activity of focusing on the receptor itself. And then, as uh, Johanna was alluding to, several actually small molecule inhibitors uh, in development. Uh, you know, some some we've already gotten results on, and some we're waiting on results. Uh, but uh, those are the main mechanisms. Though there are other drugs, peptide inhibitors, that p potentially are also in development. One of the one of the dilemmas, I think, with the antibody development, at least initially, was um, was agonist activity. So that actually some of the early attempts. Uh, with uh, drug development uh, were the development of, of um, antibodies that linked to the receptor. So they did the job well at uh, binding the receptor, blocking ligand binding and stimulation, but the actual binding of the, of the antibody to the receptor caused agonist activity. And so, so they caused dimerization and in, activation. And, uh, you know, of course, that's not the direction you want to go. Right. And so uh, one of the struggles has been how do you overcome that in your, in your drug design, your antibody design? And, and one drug we'll talk about from uh, Genentech Roche has tried to overcome that with its uh, unique one-arm design. Um, what's interesting is one of the drugs uh, Johanna was alluding to, rilotumumab, uh, my understanding is early on actually there was some concerns about this agonist activity and yet this is the drug that's showing promise in gastric cancer. So maybe, maybe what's seen in the lab doesn't really translate to uh, anything clinically meaningful. So that's where we're at right now, and um, certainly uh, many, many drugs at different stages of development in, in lung cancer. Uh, there's been some excitement, I guess, with two, two drugs uh, in that they've made it to phase three trials, and one of those phase three trials have, has closed early, so we know results already from that trial. Um, so maybe, maybe we'll talk about that first. Uh, that was uh, uh, Tavantinib. Um, which, which and Tavantinib is a fairly selective CMET uh, inhibitor? So uh, this is where I think, uh, you know, there's some... There's always some debate here about how good of a CMET inhibitor is this drug, uh, because we know that there are other targets for this compound. In fact, I think sometimes unfairly this drug gets labeled as a bad CMET inhibitor um, because its uh, other, other uh, targets may be more relevant in its anti-tumor uh, efficacy. But, but I think there's enough uh, preclinical data to suggest that there, there is inhibition of the MET pathway with this drug. Uh, that was reasonable enough to explore this in lung cancer. And <clears throat> Johanna, you know, can certainly get into some of the GI data, but um, to walk you through this, basically this drug was first studied, it's an oral medication, this drug was first studied in a randomized phase two fashion um, in a patient population of uh, non-small cell lung cancer that had already received first-line chemotherapy. So the same patient population in BR21, right. Uh, where erlotinib tarsiva was compared with nothing, supportive care. So in this uh, randomized phase two study, uh, 
patients received uh, erlotinib in both arms, um, but one arm received tavantinib with that. And it was a, a, a trial that was designed to look at an improvement in progression-free survival. Right. Hoping to block two receptors. Right. So, yeah, and I apologize I didn't get into that, but uh, you alluded to these, uh, the crosstalk. Johanna was talking about the importance of crosstalk and hetero heterodimerization with other pathways, specifically EGFR. So there's, there's known interaction with EGFR, and, and something we didn't touch on is uh, some, some groups, uh, in particular the Mass General group, Jeff Engelman's group, was the first group to help show us that activation of the MET pathway could be a mechanism of resistance for patients who had initially responded to EGFR tyrosine kinase inhibitors like erlotinib and gefitinib. So if you're on a drug like erlotinib and ultimately that drug stops working for you, MET could be a, an, one explanation for why that patient developed resistance. There's been some debate as to how frequent that is. I think in Jeff's original publication, it was thought maybe that was 20% of all resistance uh, mechanisms. It's, I think, I think uh, that number is probably lower in, uh, in, in today's view, but uh, certainly it's one mechanism of resistance. So there's rationale to combine a MET inhibitor with erlotinib. So uh, to cut to the chase, in this trial, uh, there was a suggestion of some advantage in, um, in uh, a subset of patients in this study. So the patient enrolled patients with squamous tumors and non-squamous tumors. In the non-squamous subset, there was a, um, an advantage in favor of the combination versus erlotinib alone. That did not translate into an overall survival advantage, however. There was also some subset suggestions in KRAS mutants, so in patients with KRAS mm. mutations, but the numbers are very small. Actually, all these subsets in a randomized phase two study uh, get problematic, right, because they get very small. And KRAS mutation is a fairly common abnormality in non-squamous carcinoma. That's right. It's, it's something we expect in at least 20 to 30 percent of our patients to have a KRAS mutation. Um, so this was enough to prompt a phase three trial to move forward and say, okay, can we look at this and, and go after overall survival? Can we take patients, in this case, with adenocarcinoma, so to focus the population, and expose them to erlotinib, entivantinib, or erlotinib alone? So that trial was conducted uh, globally. Actually, our center uh, participated in that study. Uh, it was led by Giorgio Scagliotti and Alan Sandler. Um, and that trial enrolled quite well. It, uh, I think it speaks to some of the popularity of uh, uh, of this idea of a new drug, a new target. Um, this is the marquee. This is the marquee study. Um, and unfortunately, in the last uh, few months, uh, the trial finished enrollment, but a uh, press release was issued that the uh, Data Safety Monitoring Board had um, conducted an interim review, and it was felt that this trial could not achieve statistical significance um, in favor of the combination, so the trial was stopped. Um, we're still waiting on the data. All we have is the press release. Uh, there did not seem to be any major safety issues, at least uh, that was released in, you know, in, that, in that format. I expect in the next uh, several months at, uh, at our, ma our major meetings, we're going to hear more about uh, actually what was shown. Let me just finish with Tavantinib and say that there's ongoing work. There's a randomized phase two study led out of, um, out of uh, UT Southwestern looking at this similar combination in patients with KRAS mutations. So um, there's still hope, so to speak, for this compound in lung cancer, but it may be in select uh, subsets. So was the population in the marquee trial stratified for um, CMET um, amplification or overexpression so that with subset analysis we might find if there's a population there that benefited more than others? So, uh, and I apologize, as I recall, there was certainly stratification in this trial. I believe it was for EGFR mutation status and, um, and by uh, uh, performance status and prior line of therapy. But I don't recall MET status as a stratification factor. Tissue was uh, requested for this trial, and they are, uh, there are plans to look at MET, um, uh, met uh, signaling by all of, all of these uh, capacities to measure it, uh, so by immunohistochemistry, amplification, and mutation status. So we await those, uh, those subset data, but no, you did not, you did not 
uh, get chosen to go on an RMA or RMB based on your uh, med expression status. Yeah. So the primary endpoint overall survival was not positive, but we may yet get some interesting data out of that trial. Yeah, I mean, all, all we know is that uh, had the trial proceeded, it would not ever achieve uh, you know, the statistical boundary to, uh, for, for overall, excuse me, overall survival significance, uh, but, but no numbers have been released, so we, we don't know that yet. For sure. All right. Well, Joanna, let's, let's talk a little bit about the monoclonal antibodies. Um, David mentioned rilatumumab and, um, and uh, the um, onartizumab, uh, difficult drug to pronounce. Uh, what is the story with those agents uh, in the GI malignancies? So rilatumumab is a drug that binds to HGF. So just like bevacizumab binds to VEGF to prevent it from binding to the receptor to activate it, rilatumumab binds to HGF to prevent it from binding to CMET to activate it. And so we saw... So it's almost like VEGF trap in that in that way. It exactly. It'll bind to that ligand. Sucks up the ligand. Exactly. Yeah. And so what we saw from a randomized phase two study of patients with metastatic gastroesophageal cancer, first line, and they were randomized to chemotherapy plus or minus rilatumumab. Now, again, just as David was saying, these are small numbers of patients. But what was very interesting is in the overall intent to treat population, there seemed to be a trend towards improved progression-free survival as well as overall survival, treating with rilatumumab plus chemotherapy versus chemotherapy alone. What was even more interesting is when they broke it down into the MET high patients, so the IHC overexpressors, they seemed to have a more pronounced effect of improvement in progression-free survival and overall survival. And so then this study will now be taken into phase three, looking at chemotherapy plus or minus rilatumumab in this population. The other antibody that we're looking at is, um, uh, so the way that I remember it is one-armed tuzumab. So on our tuzumab, the one-armed yeah, okay. man from the fugitive, this is all I can think about. So this is uh, also known as metmab. And so this molecule has been looked at um, is now being currently looked at in the gastric cancer population as well. So that's involved in a randomized phase two and randomized phase three study that has just started in Europe of chemotherapy using Folfox as a backbone plus or minus on artuzumab uh, for patients with first line metastatic gastroesophageal cancers. Um, on artuzumab has also been looked at in non-small cell lung cancer, and I'll let David talk about that since he was the lead of the randomized phase two study in combination with erlotinib. Uh, but within colon cancer, we've been looking at it in the first line setting. So we've seen a lot of trying to play on the interaction of uh, met the CMET receptor with other uh, 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 receptors such as EGFR. And this is trying to play on the interaction of angiogenesis and VEGF. And so the study was uh, known as the accomplished study, a randomized phase two study of full fox bevacizumab plus or minus on artuzumab for patients with metastatic colorectal cancer. In this study, there was no stratification to MET status just because, again, even though we're seeing this trend towards improvement in outcomes in the CMET high population, we're still not sure that per tumor that's, that story is going to be the same because there's different methods of activation, there's different staining patterns. And so we did capture um, uh, MET status uh, for, for the colorectal cancer patients, and we're seeing about 40% of colorectal cancer patients are MET high. We also know that in colorectal cancer, as well as multiple other cancers, um, overexpression of CMETs associated with a poorer prognosis and a more aggressive cancer. So we're hopefully going to see data from that study um, probably later this year, uh, sometime later this year, to read out. We've also looked at other... Um, I also looked at rilatumumab and colon cancer, and this is a small randomized phase two study that looked at panitumumab versus panitumumab plus rilatumumab versus panitumumab plus AMG479, which is an IGFR inhibitor. I'll just sort of toss that last arm out right now because we didn't see any clinical signals from the IGFR inhibitor combination. But when you look at the panitumumab and the rilatumumab plus panitumumab data, the initial comparison was looking at response rate. And in panitumumab alone, for KRAS wild type patients, it was 20%. And in, and in the patients who got panitumumab plus rilatumumab, it was 30%. So, in a, a suggested improvement in response rate, the progression free survival data, though what's been presented has been early, seems to show a slight improvement in progression free survival. And so, this trial will continue on uh, to look at panitumumab versus panitumumab plus rilatumumab.
Very good. So the the uh, expression of the CMAT receptor seems to be an important factor. What about expression of the ligand? Do do patients with uh, higher than usual levels of HGF do better with rilatubumab or do worse, or do we know anything about that yet? We don't, um, and so this is an active area of investigation. People are taking blood samples um, within these studies to look at levels of HGF as well as HGF activating factor, that, that, that um, uh, enzyme that cleaves HGF to activate it. And so that might be associated with outcomes as well. And does KRAS status seem to play a role at all? Right now, we're unsure. So the studies that have been done in, for instance, colon cancer have been in the KRAS wild-type population where they're combining it with um, panitumumab. We've also seen a, a study, a randomized phase two, of cetuximab plus arenotecan plus or minus tevantinib. Um, and so far, we don't know that, that KRAS story within colorectal cancer. Very good. Okay. Thanks, Johanna. So, David, um, Johanna gave you a segue yeah, into sure. the, uh, the one-arm tuzumab uh, <laughs> in, in lung cancer and metmab. Yeah. And I know a, a couple years ago at ASCO there was some data um, in non-small cell lung cancer with metmab. Tell us that story and, and how things are proceeding with that agent in non-small cell. Yeah, sure. I, I think... Uh, you know, this has been an interesting story so far, but, uh, you know, I'm quick to say we're, we're waiting on more mature results. Um, I think the story of uh, onartuzumab or metmab, I think, is commonly referred to, starts, starts with a phase one trial that uh, was conducted by Ravi Salgia out of the University of Chicago. Uh, interesting trial, they, uh, was, it was for patients with refractory tumors um, that, uh, where they got onartuzumab alone, and there was another cohort um, which uh, Johanna knows about, uh, where they combine that with bevacizumab. We don't hear much about that. Uh, what's interesting about that phase one experience is that there was one patient with gastric cancer who had a, an unbelievable response, actually a complete response, and it didn't come early. The, the complete response came later. Now, as uh, Johanna has already you know, well described, gastric cancer seems to be a great tumor type to, to use these anti-MET uh, therapies, and it's probably because of this autocrine loop, this overproduction of uh, HGF in that tumor type. Um, but that was a nice signal there to help in this drug's development. There, there have been preclinical studies that suggest if you take cell lines that are sensitive to drugs like erlotinib and you expose those cell lines to things like HGF, the sensitivity is lost. Uh, the erlotinib sensitivity is lost, and you can restore that sensitivity uh, in the presence of a drug like metmab or onartuzumab. So there was some rationale to combine metmab or onartuzumab with erlotinib. So what, uh, what was done was a um, randomized phase two trial was conducted. It was uh, run actually a global study uh, that we participated in, um, very similar to the um, Arcule or tevantinib phase two experience. So this was patients who normally would get erlotinib, uh, patients in the second and third line setting. They weren't uh, enrolled on this trial um, based on their MET status. I'll get to that in a moment. Uh, it was the typical enrollment criteria for patients who had one or two prior lines of systemic therapy, regardless of non-small uh, non cell histology. And the randomization was pretty simple. It was erlotinib alone or erlotinib and uh, onartuzumab, which is we didn't say this, is, uh, is given intravenously every three weeks. Although when you're in the colorectal trial, I think the dosing was, uh, was different. This trial uh, was designed to look at two primary endpoints, so uh, both for progression-free survival. One was in the overall intent to treat population, and then one was in a predefined MET positive or MET high population. And so let me take a moment to, to talk about that because that's an interesting uh, story in, in two ways. One is, uh, was, was a good example of the importance of collecting tissue. So in this randomized phase two study, every patient had to have sufficient tissue for this analysis. You didn't, you didn't have to know the results of that to get onto this study, but you had to have enough tissue. So this is this is a little commentary on, on phase two studies, certainly that can be done in the community, where you can ask your pathologist and require them to check off, so to speak, that yes, Mrs. Smith or Mr. Williams has enough tissue for enrollment on this trial. And that extra kind of nuisance, you know, Johan and I, uh, 
we cringe sometimes. We think about things that make our trials more complex, but that, that extra complexity is what made this trial interesting. So what happened was, um, was every patient sample was assessed for a number of things, including MET status by immunohistochemistry, but also KRAS and EGFR mutation status. There were actually some other correlative uh, studies performed as well. Before the data were unblinded, patients were scored based on their MET status. And it was anticipated that about half of the patients would be MET high and half would be MET low, so to speak. The MET high group was a group of patients who had two plus or three plus tumors by IHC and at least 50% of the tumor cells. As it turned out, about 50%, it was 52% of patients had MET high tumors. So um, that, that was very helpful for a small study where the numbers worked out uh, almost as an even split. To cut to the chase, there was no real advantage for things like response rate. Um, but for, for progression-free survival, in the, in, um, excuse me, in the MET high defined group, there was an advantage for PFS. And that translated, surprisingly, into an OS overall survival advantage. Now, what's interesting is in the overall intent to treat group, there was no split of the curves. They, they sit right on top of each other. So when you look at the MET low group, because they were enrolled in this trial as well, there was actually a disadvantage to getting onartuzumab so and erlotinib. So they did worse, which, which explains why the overall intent to treat group matched up. One group met high did well, and one group met low did worse. Um, and of course, they met in the middle in the, when you combine the results. The met high data set is what has prompted a uh, pivotal randomized phase three study that's in progress right now. So that trial, which uh, has been underway uh, globally, is a trial where, yes, you need to have refractory second, third line non-small cell lung cancer, but the difference here is you need to have met high expression. Very good. Well, we'll get into more details on, on those phase three trials in the next segment. So this has been very interesting. A lot of, a lot of uh, very intriguing data coming out of these early trials, and it's going to be very interesting uh, to see what, what happens with the ongoing phase two trials and the phase three trials that we'll talk about in the next segment. So thank you both very much for this, and we'll conclude this session, and we'll move on in a few minutes to uh, part three and talk about the phase three data and, uh, and some, of the, uh, some of the other novel agents that are in early trials. Thanks so much.